Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to church this morning. Thank you for joining us in person. Thank you for joining us online. Sorry we're running a little late this morning. We had some mega, mega, mega technical difficulties this morning. So we're, we're th hoping right now that everything's up and running and, and that we'll be able to be well and good online. And, and obviously in person, the technical difficulties don't matter nearly as much, that, that we're just people. And so it's a little easier to, to relate and be together in, in person, but if you're joining us online, thank you so much for being here today. We're so grateful for, for this chance to be together and be together as family. Just before we, we start into our service this morning, I do want to share a couple of things with you just before we get started. Um, first, um, the first announcement that I have is connected to, to our masks, is, is with, with the mandate that's come from our, our provincial government and our city government. Obviously, if you're joining us in person, um, we are in full compliance as best as we can with the, the mask bylaw that, that's been given to Airdrie and given to us as a result of that, and so we're excited for that. We're excited not because we have to wear masks, but we're excited because we can still be together. And we're excited because a mask doesn't stop God. A mask doesn't stop the move of God. A mask doesn't stop God working in our lives. And so we get to be together. Now, one of the things that we're, we're going to be experimenting with and is seeing some different ways that we can be compliant with our mask bylaw. One of the ways that we've been working on is, is even just here with Jordan leading worship. Matt, Pastor Matt's done a great job of sort of constructing a, a face shield for Jordan so that he'll be able to, to lead worship without a mask on and, and those kind of things. And we're working on building out so, so that some more of our worship team members are able to do that. But we're going to be looking, like we talked about last week, there's going to be some changes and some adjustments that go as, as we go, really just as, as we're learning how to respond in, in what amounts again to another new normal that we have as a church here. But we're, we're excited for all that God has for this season. The other thing that, that is a bit of an adjustment is, is with the new government, provincial government regulations, um, we have had to reduce our capacity again. Um, so that's why there is, there is a few less chairs in the sanctuary for, for people to be a part. So if you would like to come to church on Sundays, it, it is kind of important that, we, that you register early because it might fill up quicker now because we can only, instead of having about between 40 and 50 people, we can now have at the most 33. And so that, that will affect our ability to, to meet that way. But so those are just some of the adjustments that we've had to make in terms of, of that and just keeping you in the loop on everything that's going on there. The next announcement that I want to share with you is about our Wednesday night prayer group. Um, we are still able to meet and gather for prayer, so you're invited to come and join with us for prayer in two different ways. Um, first, on, on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, you are welcome to come and gather here at the church. We'll be socially distant, and, and we will have our masks on. It is, is a social gathering, and so because of that, we have to have our masks on, and so we will have masks. Now, if you don't want to be socially distant, if you don't want to wear a mask, you are welcome to join us online. Is that, that's a fully valid and fully acceptable way to join us, just like you're joining us online today. And so we're really excited about the, the opportunities that God has given us in a technological way to be able to gather here, there, and everywhere and still continue to pray together. All of those rules and restrictions, the, the, the social distancing and, and the masks and all of those things, those will also touch base with our men's breakfast that we're having this upcoming Saturday at 9 o'clock in the morning. We're going to be able to be together. We'll be socially distanced. We'll have masks on. Um, but if, if you want to join with us just for a morning, uh, just a time to catch up and, and reacquaint ourselves with each other and find out how we're all doing, 9 o'clock Saturday morning here at the church for all, all the men in the church. And the last thing that I just want to remind you of is our newsletter, that you can sign up for our newsletter um, online at, at our website, cornerstonefoursquarechurch.com, and then click on Airdrie, and at the bottom of every single page, there's a place where it'll say, sign up for our newsletter, click here. And so you can just enter in your email address there, and that'll give you a chance to, to hear everything that we've got going on as a church, week in and week out, all of the different things. And as... as the, the response of our province to COVID adjusts and the response of our city to COVID adjusts as everything moves and changes, um, there will be lots of opportunities for you to get in caught up in information as, as we have to sometimes adjust really quickly and on the fly. And so that's a great way to do that. Um, the last thing that I want to share with you before we, we start into our service is we have a guest with us this morning. 
We've got Jordan from the City View, and he's here. They're doing a story on the impact of COVID on different organizations and groups and businesses across the city. And so they asked, could they send somebody here to our service this morning to, to just document what church sort of looks like in, in COVID times? And so we're glad to have Jordan here. Um, he's going to be taking some pictures of our service. If, if for some reason you're, if you're in the witness protection program and you don't want your picture shown up in the paper because the mob will find you or, or whatever it may be, if, if you're here and you don't want or you're sensitive about your picture being taken and all of that, you can come and let Jordan, you can speak directly to Jordan or come and speak to me and I can relate that to him as well. But we're glad to have you with us. Thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, I want to just let you know, as we're about to, to launch into our, our service, I'm going to pray for us in a moment and, and then we'll start. But I really need a touch from the Lord this morning. Is, is this morning was, was I, I woke up this morning feeling like there was a dark cloud and, and it hasn't gone away even as church has started this morning. And so I, I really need a touch from the Lord this morning. And, and I hope that, that we all come with the expectation of a touch from the Lord this morning. It's, it can be a struggle in my life. There, there's, in some ways, there's no place I would want to be less than here right now. Um, just feeling, struggling emotionally, all of those kinds of things. The computer's not working and just everything is, is not good. But there's also no place I'd rather be. Is, is here with the Lord and, and with an opportunity for him to speak to me and to minister to me. And, and I believe that in his presence is fullness of joy. And I believe that those who wait upon the Lord will renew their strength and will rise up on wings as eagles and he will work in us. And so I, I need a touch from the Lord this morning and I'm really hoping and praying in expectancy that he's going to meet me and he's going to meet you. And I know that there's so many gathered at home watching online or even in here in person that need a touch from the Lord this morning. And we really do believe that we serve a God who ministers to us. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he met the woman at the well. He met all kinds of people all along his journey when they needed a touch from him the most. And so this morning, we're trusting and believing that the Lord's going to do that for us today. So I'm going to take a moment and pray, and then Jordan and the team are going to come and lead us in worship. Lord Jesus, we, we come before you this morning as your children, and, and we come to our Heavenly Father. We come to our, our Dad this morning, and we, we just really pray that in this moment, in this time, as your church, as your children gathered together, God, whether we're here in person or whether we're watching online, whether we're, whether we're, we're a part of church here or we're a part of church online, God, we just really pray that in this moment and in this time, God, that you would meet us, that, that your Holy Spirit would come and minister to us. God, where, where we're weak, God, would you make us strong? God, where we're tired, would you give us new life? God, where we're, we're sad, may you give us joy. God, where we're angry, may you give us peace. God, in all of the places in our lives where we need a touch from you this morning, God, would you speak to us? Would you minister to us? Would you give us wholeness and health and healing this morning? God, we, we, we rely completely and totally and utterly on you this morning. And so, God, may you touch your kids. May you touch our hearts and our lives this morning. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, yeah, as we <coughs> open this morning, I don't got much to say, um, but I want to encourage you um, in these spaces of music, whatever, again, this is not karaoke, you're not called to sing, you're called to pray and to worship, <laughs> um, and what does that look like? Maybe this will help you or whatever, but we pray and we hope that you feel freedom to go in whatever direction you need this morning, uh, whether it's to sit or stand, um, silence, open your Bible, if there's a psalm or something he's bringing your mind to, whatever that may be. Um, but yeah, this 
is merely meant to be a help and a guide, a, a diving board into worship. Um, and so we pray that you just feel that freedom this morning with whatever you're bringing.
Heaven-spun creation is brought in adoration, treasures woven by his law. His careful hands they hold us safe within his promise, calling end of destiny. And I will sing you've done and I'll remember how for you carried me from beginning until the end you are faithful faithful to the end a father's heart that's for me never story a love that's always chasing me this kindness overwhelming oh for me and me he's never given up on me and I will sing of all the That you weren't by my side. There wasn't a day that you let me fall. And all of my life, your love has been true. And with all of my life, I worship you. There wasn't a day that you weren't by my side. And there wasn't a day that you let me fall. And all of my life, your love has been true. And with all of my life, I worship you. Oh, I would declare oh, the goodness of my God. He is still good. That you're not by my side There won't be a day That you let me fall And all of my life Your love has been true And with all of our lives We worship you There won't be a day That you're not by my side there won't be a day that you let me fall and all of my life your love will be true and with all of our lives we worship you we worship I 
will sing of all you've done and I'll remember how for you carried me from beginning until the end you are faithful And I will sing out all you've done, and I'll remember how for you carried me from beginning to the end. You are faithful, faithful to have a word of encouragement for the church this morning. Um, I was just having a, a little bit of time this morning before I got up and my mind wasn't really focusing on anything at all and God just spoke to my heart that there are over 365 verses about fear not in the Bible. And with everything that's going on in our society, in our world, there seems to be a lot of reason for fear. But in Joshua 1.9, God commands us. He said, have I not commanded you? That's a strong word. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not tremble, nor be dismayed. For the Lord your God, he is with you. And that's a promise that we have to hold on to. And I know it's not easy. I struggle with it probably every day at some stage of the game or another. But God has promised, and his promises are yes and amen. And when we allow the fear to come in, we are actually allowing the enemy of our lives to come in. Because he is the author of fear. God is not the author of fear. He has said, I have not, I have not authored fear. Fear comes from the enemy, and he comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need to stand on the faith that we have. I don't think we've ever been challenged as a church in North America through a time like we're facing right now. Everything that we hear is immediate. Even in the Second World War, there was time lapses, so it wasn't up close and personal, it wasn't in your face, it wasn't this is real time happening. This is real time happening. And as a church, we need to take a stance to stand, to commit when the Lord calls, have I not commanded you? That, that's me. Have I not commanded you, Barb? Have I not commanded you? Eve, have I not commanded you, Brenda? Have I not commanded you, Brad, to not be afraid? Do not be dismayed. Do not tremble. For the Lord, our God, he is with us. Can I get an amen?
faith and wonder say you are good you are strong you are proving my fears wrong you are proving my fears wrong when my eyes cannot see the way Faith in what you said, you are good, you are strong, you are proving my fears wrong, you are proving my fears wrong, you are proving my fears wrong, you are proving my fears wrong. Unbound hope and unwavering trust that we're safe here in your arms, and your word is always true. In the midst of all this darkness, your light shines through. It's breaking through the door. The door can overcome. No, I can see it now. When my eyes cannot see the way ahead, I will walk by faith in what you said that you are good, you are sure. Proving my fears wrong, you are proving my fears wrong. Give us unbound hope and unwavering trust that we're safe here in your arms, and your word is always true. In the midst of all this darkness, your light shines through. Give us unbound hope and unwavering trust that we're safe here in your arms and your word is always true. In the midst of all this darkness, your light shines through. Oh, surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me. And surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me. Silence my fear. Peace be still. You are me. You are here. Lord, quiet my soul. Hold me close. Never let go. 
come to you. Silence my God who spoke, let there be light, is the same God who's speaking now. like many
because you first loved us. We pray for those moments where we feel our love is starting to run dry and our faith is starting to run cold. That you mind us and you fill us again with your love and care. 
you are leading us through and out of this. That you are a shepherd who brings us and is near to us in the valleys, in the pastures, in the rivers. There's never a space where you say, I will not go with you. You follow us and you redeem us and you restore us for your own namesake. You are a shepherd and we want nothing else. Would you carry us through this like lambs in your arms, God? Carry us through this season. Amen. Amen. Just, you can just leave that. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> hey! Goodness gracious, what a day. It's a good thing the newspaper here is, is here to report on all this today, I tell you. <laughs> um, this week, if you want to join us in Scripture, you can turn to Genesis chapter 31. Um, really, we're going to be reading just three verses from there, but ultimately it's the place where we're going to end up. Um, over the last few weeks, we've been looking at um, what I, I think is, is one of the more interesting lives in all of Scripture. Um, we've been talking about the life of Jacob, and we've been looking at his life through this lens of understanding his story and how his story moves from his introduction in Scripture all the way through, and the theme has been broken to blessed. But so far, in all of these stories and all of the, the this verses that we've looked at so far, we're still pretty broken. Um, we haven't transferred very far. We've looked at this is our fourth, our fourth, our fourth in, installment of a seven-part series, and and all the first three, they've all been really broken. And and I've got some bad news for you. Um, chapter 4, we're going to stay pretty broken. Um, it, it's this fascinating story of, of this, the, the juxtaposition perhaps of, of how we understand our patriarchs of our faith. Um, we, look, we can look at, at some of these people that make up our faith even though at times it can be complicated, that when we look at lives from Scripture and look at different people from Scripture, sometimes we can look and, well, it's a complicated thing. But with Jacob, at times, at least this far into his story, it's pretty unredeemable. Um, it's not complicated. Is, is his life has, has been a mess. It's a life full of lies and dishonesty and manipulation. And even last week, we saw this moment where God shows up and speaks to Jacob in a dream. And from this dream, God commits himself to Jacob, not because of anything redeemable that Jacob had done or what Jacob brings to the table, but because of God's complete faithfulness to his covenant that he made with Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, and God's love and desire to redeem all of mankind. God shows up and, and he says this to Jacob, to this broken, lying, deceitful manipulator. He says this to him. Uh, there above it stood the Lord. He's dreaming of the, 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 the stairway to heaven with all of the angels going up and down. And so there above that, sta that, that, that stairway stood the Lord. And, and the Lord says to Jacob, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are living. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I've promised you. 
this amazing, affirming promise to Jacob that God is with Jacob and he's for him. God is committed to him and he will bless him. Jacob's family are going to stretch out all over the world and through them the entire world is going to be blessed. And God says, I'm going to remain faithful to you through all of this. You have my word, I am God. It's this amazing moment, this life-altering, destiny-defining kind of moment. I mean, this is one of the main reasons Jacob lied and, to his dad and deceived and manipulated and stole from his brother was to get this promise on his life. This is part of what Jacob was looking for. He knew that this promise had been given to his grandfather, and he knew that if Esau, ha if, if, if everything stayed the same, that promise was going to Esau. So he needed to, that, this was part of the reason why he did all of this, was this promise, this blessing, this birthright. And God shows up and he says to him, hear it from my lips to your ears. All of it is yours. Everything that, that I have for you as God is yours. Everything Jacob had wanted, God has said, it's yours now. And then our hero, Jacob essentially says to God, okay, prove it. I'll believe it when I see it. That, that God shows up and affirms himself and Jacob says, I mean, if you get me back to where I was and take care of me along the way, then I'll serve you. Ball's in your court, God. Not exactly the kind of response you would imagine from someone who had just been told by God that everything you wanted, everything you ever wanted, you are going to get from God. But this is our main character. This is the patriarch of our faith, or one of the patriarchs, from broken to blessed. And, and so we continue on with our story, but we're going to kind of move through a lot of text this morning. So I'm not going to specifically read to you three chapters worth of verses this morning, that that could get a little monotonous. So like I said, I'm going to just kind of fill you in and tell you the story as we go, as we transition all the way up to Genesis chapter 31. But, and, and we'll flash some, some scriptures up on the screen so you can sort of see and reference where we are in the story. But as chapter 29 begins, we see that Jacob completes the about 500-mile journey to his uncle Laban's house. And something that's going to be really interesting to see as we move through our stories this morning is how Jacob is really going to reap what he sowed. That, that his experience at his uncle Laban's house are marked so much by the same things that Jacob's life had been about before we get there. How, how Jacob's life is going to be reflected back to him in his uncle. And so in Genesis chapter 29, Jacob reaches a well and he discovers that he's made his way to, to Laban's or lands. And he meets a girl. He, he meets Rachel. And he tries to impress her right away. He, he meets up with these shepherds at, at a watering well, and, and, he, and he discovers that he's in the right place. And, and it, the, the scripture will say that, that, that on top of this well, there was a stone, and it was a large, a large stone that sat on top of this well. And we're told that it's large, and it was so large that the shepherds would all work together to roll the stone away and then to put it in place when they were done. But Jacob sees Rachel. And he jumps into what all guys try to do when they see a pretty girl. He immediately tries to figure out how to impress her. How to make her think, well, oh, he's cool. He's tough. He's strong. And so he jumps in. And, and he, as she approaches the well, he tells her, don't worry. I, I've got this. I can do it all by myself. Don't even worry. And so scripture will say that he rolls the stone away all by himself just to show Rachel how cool and tough and strong he is, just to impress this girl that, that is pretty. And so he jumps at this chance to, to impress her, and, and he falls for her, and, and she takes him back to meet Laban. And, and Laban accepts Jacob into his family, 
And, and oh, I'm a little bit behind here. Mouth of the well. Then, okay, Jacob, or Laban accepts Jacob into his family and invites him to live there. Now, when we talked about Jacob and Esau and Isaac and, and all of that, we talked about birthrights and we talked about blessings and, and all of these kinds of things. And we talked about how one of the things that, that Esau inherited as the, the oldest son would be that he would become the head of the family. That, that everyone would follow his lead. Well, Laban has that same stature, that same mantle where he lives. He's the head of his family. So when Jacob comes to live with him, when Jacob comes to live there, he is then put under Laban. That Laban is still the head of, of the family. He's still the top of the pyramid. And so Laban tells Jacob that, that there's an expectation on him that if you're coming here, you're coming to work for me. But it doesn't mean that you need to work for free. And he says, well, you don't need to work for nothing. What should your wages be? And then we come to another one of these really problematic points in, in the culture of the time with, that has to do with who and what women are. Um, a problematic sort of, as, as we look back on and understand what's taking place culturally, today we go and we go, this is kind of ugh, not good. As Jacob says to, to, to Laban, I will work for you for seven years in, in return for your daughter Rachel. That they make an agreement that she would be his wage. That I'll work for you for seven years. And if I work for you for seven years, then, then you give me your daughter Rachel in marriage. And Laban agrees. Although not particularly with a giant ringing of endorsement. He kind of just says, well, it's better I give her to you than somebody else. So not exactly like a blessing, not exactly the, the strong, hey, what a great idea. And so Jacob works for Laban for seven years. Now, we can all agree that seven years is, is a long time. But let's put it into context. Seven years ago was 2013. 2013 was the year of the, the major floods in Calgary and in southern Alberta, that, that when the Bow River flooded and the Saddle Dome got wiped out and, and all kinds of, of stuff. We had friends sleeping on a mattress in our basement because they had to evacuate out of Bonas. And it was the year Nelson Mandela died. It was the year of the Boston Marathon bombing. Prince William and Kate had their first baby, George. The Chicago Blackhawks defeated the Boston Bruins in the Stanley Cup final. The Oscar for Best Picture went to Argo. Frozen was the number one movie in theaters. One Direction, Midnight Memories, was the number one selling album. And above all of that, more important than any of it, it was the year Theo was born. And so seven years ago is a long time. Seven years is a while. But Jacob puts his time in. And he finally gets to this day. And it's actually kind of funny because he's, he's really honest with, with Laban. He's really honest with Rebecca's dad. In fact, probably way too honest with a girl's dad about wanting to get to the wedding day. Now, because it's a family service, I'm not going to read verse 21 to you. Um, there, are, there are younger ears here. But if you want to see just how honest... Jacob is about his desire to, to marry Rachel, or not, I'm sorry, marry Rachel, marry Rebecca. You can turn to uh, verse 21 of, of that chapter, and you'll discover just what he has to say to the girl's father. Remember that as you read it. And, and so they have their wedding day. Now, you remember how in, in his moment of, of need, his moment of want, his, his moment of desire, Jacob sees that opportunity to exploit his brother. That his brother came in from the field starving and hungry, and Jacob had made his brother's favorite meal, and his brother comes in and says, give me some of the red stuff. And Jacob says, oh, it's all yours. But I'm going to take advantage of this situation, and I'm going I'm to impose on you something that you're not expecting in order to get this. Well... The same thing is about to happen to Jacob. 
He's about to be on the other end of this same experience. Because as the wedding unfolds, the bride comes out wearing a beautiful veil. And when the veil is lifted after the wedding, it's discovered that it's not Rachel that Jacob married. But instead of Rachel, Laban had sent his older daughter, Leah, to get married to Jacob. And so Jacob, understandably upset and confused and doesn't, what is happening, goes to confront Laban. And Laban essentially says, oh no, didn't I tell you? That, that's not how we do things here. I, I'm sorry. I should have told you. I don't know how that slipped my mind. I don't know how this happened. You see, here we have a tradition where the younger daughter can't get married before the older daughter or the older sister. So somehow there was a miscommunication. And, and you thought that you were working for seven years to, to marry Rebecca. And, and we'll get there. But, but we can't marry Rebecca before, before Leah. So I, I cannot believe that in the last seven years this never came up. I don't know how it didn't come up. But you got to marry Leah first. But do I have a deal for you? Because if you want to finish out or, or a deal for you, because you, you had told me, you had said that you would work for Rebecca for seven years. Well, if I got a deal for you now, now that Leah's married, there, there's nothing stopping Rebecca from being married. Sorry, I keep saying Rebecca. It's Rachel. I don't know why. Um, but you, 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 you have, you worked for these, these seven years and, and you, Culturally, now, now Rachel can be married. So what's another seven years? Work for another seven years, and then you can marry her. So seven more years, 14 years in total. 14 years ago was 2006. In 2006, Pluto lost its status as a planet. Saddam Hussein was killed. It was also the year that the crocodile hunter Steve Irwin died. The Carolina Hurricanes defeated the Edmonton Oilers in the Stanley Cup Finals. Sorry, Greg and Maria. I know that's a painful memory. Best picture was Crash. The highest grossing movie was Pl Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. And probably nothing encapsulates the, the time of this more than the fact that the highest grossing album of the year, the best selling album of the year, was the high school musical soundtrack. <laughs> so that's, that's 14 years ago. So you think back to these reference points in your life, and it was 14 years ago. All that to say is this is a long, long time, but Jacob puts in the work. And eventually, he's allowed to marry the girl that he wants to marry. They have their wedding day. And finally, everything is good. And then Jacob, like you do, looks to grow his family with children. And the last verses of chapter 29, from, from the time they get married, in the first 22 verses of chapter 30, they tell the story of Jacob's family growing. Twelve children in all. And it is easily some of the saddest and just broken chunks of scripture. We, we see his family grow and expand. Go, going back to what I said earlier, I won't get into all the ugly details because it's a family service, but it's not good. It's not healthy. Everyone is miserable. As you read through these verses, everybody is miserable. Everyone is hurt. It's ugly. And to put it bluntly, it's gross. As you read through how, how his family grows. And, and we know that, that Jacob's 12 children go on to become the, the symbols for the 12 tribes of Israel. But when you read what they were born out of, it's, 
It's gross. It's painful to read. It's, it, everybody is not good. But after 12 kids coming out of this ugly story, Jacob decides it's time to go home. And so he goes to his uncle and says to him, let me leave with, with my family, with my wives and my children and my stuff, and it's time for me to go. I feel like I'm ready to leave. He, he had grown a lot, obviously, in family. He's got multiple wives now. He's got lots of kids, lots of possessions, lots of stuff. I'd like to go back home. But in verse 27 of, of the next chapter, of chapter 30, Laban says to him, I have found favor in, if I have found favor in your eyes, please stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And so, so really, Laban is, is seeing that, that good things are happening having this guy around. And so he wants him to stay because he believes that it's good for him if, if Jacob stays. Jacob stays, things are going well. It seems like my, my stuff is going well. My, my herds are growing. Things are good. And, and so it, it's better for me for you to stay, so stay. And he says to him, you can na name your wage. What do you want? What do you want for me to agree to let you stay? And Jacob, being Jacob decides, well, if I can use this to my advantage, I'll stay. And we come to this place where, where Jacob decides he's going to stay for a while and that he's allowed to grow his possessions and his family's stuff in preparation to leave. And he comes up with a plan. See, it's been a lot of years. 14 years to get married and enough for 12 children to be born. But in all of that time, Jacob is still Jacob. He, he, he's not, he, he hasn't changed who he was. And so he asks his uncle if for his wage he could have all of the spotted and speckled goats, which on the surface are the ones that you don't want. It's like a, 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 a humility. Uh, if you give me all of the flawed ones, you see, the, the, the ones with a pure coat, the ones without the spots and the speckles, they were highly esteemed, highly prized. But Jacob says, Here, just, just give me the ones you don't want anyway. Seems like a nice thing to do. But Jacob's got a plan. And he uses his position as the person who oversees the sheep to ensure that, that the goats that he was asking for, which in theory are the less desirable ones because of these speckles and spots, he ensures by making sure the right ones are breeding with the right ones, and he has a pretty advanced understanding of genetics and all of these kinds of things, but he ensures that the, the speckled and the spotted ones become the stronger ones and the healthier ones, and become the better ones, become the better goats, the better sheep in the herd. Jacob being Jacob takes advantage of the situation he's in. He, he manipulates and he, he deceives and he takes advantage of this place to, to make the situation better for himself, growing himself stronger and healthier sheep. And at the beginning of chapter 31, it's really starting to turn. Remember, we just said Laban said, you know, it's good for me if you stay. It's good for me. Things are going well because you're here. Well, chapter 31, it's beginning to turn. Verse 1 says, Jacob heard that Laban's sons, so, so the people who were actually there watching their sheep, their herds getting weaker and weaker and his growing, saying, Jacob has taken everything that our father owned and has gained all this wealth from what belonged to our father. And Jacob noticed that Laban's attitude towards him was not what it had been. The worm is turning. Situation is changing. It's not the, this happy, harmonious, well, it was never a happy and harmonious relationship. Jacob and his family are growing and becoming more and more wealthy and becoming more and more prominent. And Laban and his family are starting to notice, and they're not happy. And then we come to verse 3. And on the surface, verse 3 is not particularly perhaps the most notable verse. If, if you have your Bibles or, or your apps, it's maybe not something you've underlined or got notes or circled or say, this is my life verse. But 
there's something about that I think is really important to understand about God and his part in this story. In verse 3, it says, Then the Lord said to Jacob, Go back to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. Jacob's time with his uncle was, to put it simply, not good. There was nothing that we really read here that's good. I, I suppose Jacob fell in love. And there was a love story. So I guess on some level that's good. But that, even that, is, is shrouded in pain and hurt. And you read, as you read through the, some of the verses we skipped over, like Leah is not loved. And so she's stuck in this, this loveless marriage because Jacob wanted to marry Rachel. Leah is forced to, into a loveless marriage that she never wanted to a husband who had to be tricked into marrying her. And then there's Jacob's relationship with his uncle where they clearly do not have any trust for each other and have absolutely no issue with taking advantage of each other to get what they want at each other's expenses. His relationship with his uncle is deeply, deeply flawed. They're exploiting each other and taking advantage of each other. Lying to get your daughter married? Essentially manipulating to make yourself richer at the other's expense? It's all bad. I know that I've said this a few times over this series and over even this sermon, but it's all bad. We keep coming back to this point. This isn't a story about good godly people doing good, godly things to each other. It's not the story of people following God with everything inside of them, fighting for God and for his will to be done. This is a story of all bad. But in verse 3, it tells us that God is still present and that God is still working. Jacob had tried to go home earlier. But God hadn't told him it was time to leave yet. And Jacob stays. Now, him staying just ends up in more lies and manipulation. But God wasn't, it wasn't time, God's timing for him to go home yet. Not yet. Now, undoubtedly, in the 20 or so years that Jacob was with his uncle there was probably good moments. There was probably happy moments, fun moments. For him, for, for Leah, for Rachel, for, for their kids, with Jacob and his uncle, everybody along the way, there were the probably good moments. But his life isn't marked by any of that. It's marked by pain and sadness and ugliness in lots of different ways during this season. But verse 3 tells us in this kind of season, in this pain and difficult and anguishing season, God is still there working. You see, our circumstances don't shine a light on what God is doing. So often, so often we can look at our lives and we can make the assumption that based on how things are going, based on how things look, based on what I'm experiencing now in this moment in my life, this must be a reflection of God in my life. That if things are bad, I must be bad with God. If things are bad, God must be absent. If things are falling apart, God must be rejecting me. But if things are good, then God must love me again. We look at our situation right now, and, and Barb talked about this earlier, there is so much tough. COVID, and the fear that comes along with it, the fear of sickness, the fear of transmission, the fear of, of what happens if I catch it or somebody else catches it. And the frustration and the anger of the restrictions that can come of that, both of which are keeping people from coming to church which makes me so glad that we can be together online. But no one ever thought that we would be put in a position to have to make choices like this. 
And fear spreads as more cases are growing. And we, we get the reports that yesterday was the first time ever over a thousand new cases in one day. And more cases are starting to show up in schools. And more and more kids are at home because of exposure. We have multiple kids in our church that are, have to stay home because of exposure right now. And cases are rising. And masks are everywhere. And now it's all these restrictions and rules and everything. And it's just, ah! Ah! It can become so much. But what we see here is even when we're put in a situation where everything looks bad, it's ugly, it's wrong, God is still there working. We sing the song that says, even though I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. And in our story for Jacob and in our lives right now, it didn't matter what it looked like. God was still working. God was still on the throne. We're going to see next week some of what God was doing while Jacob was gone with his uncle for 20 years as he comes back home. And, and we will together... See what it is that God is doing in this season right now. But looking at his life and his experiences, it would be so easy to read and see that Jacob had been abandoned by God. That a life of sin had finally caught up to Jacob along the way. Probably somewhere in chapter 30. Again, it's, it's really messed up. That, but it would be so easy to look at his life and his experience and how everything is falling apart and falling down and just thinking and believing, God must have washed his hands of this guy. That at some point in 20, chapter 28, God made this promise to Jacob. But by chapter 30, God had said, I picked the wrong horse. I'm done with you. I'm moving on from you. And that God just washed his hands at Jacob and left him to his mess and said, you're on your own, buddy. But then we come to verse 3 of Genesis 31. God was there all along, working in Jacob and his life to see his will and his promises fulfilled. Friends, don't ever let your circumstances try and dictate to you what God is or isn't doing. It's really hard to find a shred of God in Jacob's time with his uncle. But God was still there. And if in our lives at times we can struggle to find even a shred of God in what's happening, but we have the promise that God is still there. Our circumstances can scream, God has left us. But God says the same thing to us that he says to Jacob in verse 31. I will be with you. And when we can take that promise and that assurance and apply it back to our circumstances, our circumstances may not change, but the way we see them well. To close, I, I want to read you just this last verse that, that hopefully paints this picture of an understanding of where we are and our relationship with God and how the relationship with God influences where we are, not where we are influences our relationship with God. Psalm chapter 23 verse 4 says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come to you today as your children, as those who follow you, as those who love you, as those who, who know with a certain level of understanding and a certain level of knowledge that, that you are there. But yet, God, sometimes in life, it can be hard for us to see you. 
And God, as we looked at the story of Jacob and his relationship with his, his uncle and his time spent there, this 20-year period in his life, God, it's so hard to see you there. But yet we come to this point where we discover in everything that went on, you never left. You never left him. And God, I thank you that that same thing is true for us today. That, that, that even when we can't find you, even when we can't see you, even when we, we look and we say, there's not a shred of God in my life right now. We can hold on to the knowledge, to the truth, that just like with Jacob, you are, you are there all along. That we can turn to you and we can find you. That we can look for you and we can see you. That you don't abandon us, you don't leave us, and you don't dump us off on our own. But God, you will always be there for us. God, I love you so much. And I'm so grateful for your presence in my life. And I'm so thankful that for each one of us who names the name of Jesus at our darkest, at our worst, at our most difficult to understand moments, that we can turn to you and find a loving, gracious, generous Heavenly Father who will love us and who will carry us. God, I thank you for the examples and the pictures that we have in Scripture where we can find hope seemingly in the hopeless, where we can find joy in the joyless, where we can find life in the dead. God, I thank you that even in the story of everything being bad in Jacob, there is a story of the good news of Jesus Christ, that out of death comes life, out of the worst comes the best, out of our sin and our depravity and our evil comes your love and grace and mercy, that even in this story of Jacob, we can understand and discover a picture of Jesus Christ on the cross. God, I thank you that in everything that we have, we know that we have a God who loves us and who has unbounding grace and mercy for us. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. If you're, if you're joining us in person or online and, and you don't know anything other than the darkness of the world around you, if you don't know anything other than the difficulty and the fear and the worry that life can bring, and you don't know what it is to have a light in that darkness, if you don't know what it is to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd be happy, I'd be honored, I'd be touched to pray with you and to introduce you to my friend and to my God, Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you would like, you, you say, I know Jesus, but I still need prayer. I would be glad to, to pray with you as well. But I want to thank you so much for joining us, whether in person or online. We are so eternally grateful for a God that unites his church, a God who's promised he will build his church. And hell and COVID can't stand against it. And we together will walk through this season and as we discover the goodness of God as he carries us through it. Thank you so much for being with us. God bless you. We love you so much. And we hope to see you again really soon.